the story of Israel as they left Egypt and made their way to the promised land. How many people left versus how many people actually made it? The census that Moses took shortly after they left the promised land, it seems like there was over 600 some odd thousand, I can't remember, uh, it's been so long since I read, I can't remember if that was just the men or if that included the total population. There could have been as much as a million, I don't know. But certainly at least 600,000 Israelites leaving Egypt and out of that crowd, two of them made it into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Now the others that were born in the wilderness, they got to go. They were not partakers of the sins like the rebellion of Kohath, uh, who was the first cousin to Moses, by the way. Them wanting to turn back as soon as they saw Pharaoh complain to Moses and to God that they, God didn't kill, didn't, couldn't kill him in Egypt. He had to drag him out in the wilderness to kill him. Complaining about that, getting across the Red Sea, having seen that miracle, saw the uh, miracles that God had done to get them over there. Then they got over there and complained that they had no water. Some of them wanted to go back then. Then the, the rebellion of Kohath. Kohath wanting to take over the Israelites. And God opened up the ground, swallowed many of them. Then you had them complaining and God sent the fiery serpents among them. And thousands of them died in one day they died. People died as Moses was up on Mount Sinai. And they turned against God. And was going to make air in their boss. Why don't you just take us back to Egypt. All the time they're wanting to turn around and go back to Egypt. Turn around and go back to Egypt. So I look over this crowd this morning. People that I grew up with. I know for a fact most of them are not in church. Some of the adults that I grew up under received an invitation to leave God and go serve the devil again. And that's what they did. My question this morning, who's getting their invitation next? And what are you going to do when you get it? Now I'll explain that in a minute. Turn to 2 Kings. If you're not already there, turn to 2 Kings 18. I'd like for you to look at this in your Bible. You're, let's, let's just pretend we're having a Bible study. And uh, what you're supposed to do is use what's up on the screen as a reference for you turning your Bible to what's up on the screen. Um... I like doing it that way because I go through a lot of scriptures. Sometimes I need to hurry up. I need to run through them fast. Some of you write those scriptures down. I appreciate that because that will help you study, I believe. But don't neglect the word of God, especially in God's house, especially on God's day. Somebody say amen. Now, 2 Kings chapter 18, Hezekiah is the king over Judah. In verse 3 of chapter 18 says, He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. In verse 4, I mentioned uh, the fiery serpents and Moses made the serpent out of brass and set it up and it was what it was. It was a foreshadowing of Christ. But it, it showed the death of the serpent which is the devil who has the power of death. It showed his destruction. Because what God did was, when those serpents bit those people, they died. But when Moses put that serpent, literally, I think, on something that looked like a cross, and people looked upon that, what they were doing, they were looking forward to Calvary. They were looking forward to victory. And what Christ did on the cross was, he defeated the power of death on the cross, and those that, the Bible says, that had already been bitten by the serpents, when they looked upon that, they were healed instantly. That's a picture of God healing death for us all. Somebody say amen. 
But what they did was, um, those idiots took that brazen serpent, set it up as an idol, burned incense to it. That, you know what they're doing? They're praying to that stupid idol. And Hezekiah saw it. You know what he did? What did he do to it, Chris? He broke it in pieces, amen. Sound familiar? Yeah, you get it now. What was it, last Sunday? Bob went home and he's, Chris got a box of his Vietnam stuff. And their grandson, there he is, sticking his head out the corner there. He opened it up, was going through it, and you know, saw his dog tags in there. Show him what you did to it, Bob. He saw Chris's crucifix in there that he wore. He was Catholic back then, you old heathen. And Bob came running in. <gasps> this is an idol, a dumb idol. So they let him take it out in the garage and he poured lighter fluid on it and burn it. Took a hammer and beat it and beat it to pieces. Did like Moses, ground it into powder. I'm surprised he didn't pour it in water and hand it to Chris. Say, now drink it. <clears throat> this good boy there. Well, that's what Hezekiah did. He broke it in pieces. He said, you're not going to do this anymore. We have one God. We don't serve a serpent. And verse 5 says he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Now, let's skip to verse 13. So that's the kind of man Hezekiah is. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. Now, Assyria has already taken the ten tribes of Israel. God allowed him to for their wickedness. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed him unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Now that he tried to appease him. Uh, let's see here. Where am I going with this? In verse 22. In fact, let's stop. I was going to pray. I'm getting ahead of myself, and I want to pray before we move on. I want you to bow your heads this morning. And I want to tell you something. I want to give you liberty. Okay? I want to give you liberty. With your head bowed, years ago, when I was at Richwoods, we had a couple that got on a conviction during the song service. And while we were singing, they just come up to the altar. Teary-eyed, crying, both of them. And God began to deal with them down at that altar during the song service. I had never seen nothing like that in my life, but I was sure was liking it. And I always want to give God's people liberty. I don't like to try to force people to come to the altar if God is not moving them to do it. But if God moves you to do it and you can't take it, and you feel like you just need to get up and come down and pray, you come down and pray. You don't need my permission. You're not going to mess me up. If God is moving, you respond. That's liberty. Amen? It ain't done that way in the Episcopalian church. It ain't done that way in the Catholic church. But we're not Episcopalian and we're not Catholic. And if God moves in you, you move. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, again, I come before you this morning. And Father, I do. I, do, I just I thank you, Lord, for being faithful to my prayers this week. Asking you, God, what to pray for, what to pray about, or what to preach about. And Lord, this is what you've laid on my heart. This is what you've given me. I pray, dear God, that it's apt for the situation at hand, Lord, in anybody's life. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would move. 
in my heart and move in the hearts and lives of these people gathered here this morning, <clears throat> whether they're sitting here, they're watching live, or they're watching recorded, it does not matter to me when you do it. I'm simply asking God that you do it. Father, I've gotten that invitation before, that offer, to turn around and leave and go serve under a different God. And God, I'm thankful that you didn't let me. God, that it, it was in my heart that that's not what I wanted. And Father, I don't know, Lord, in five years from now, who's going to be sitting here. I don't know. Over the years, Father, since I've been here as a little boy, I've seen people come, I've seen people go. I've seen people leave and come back. I've seen people leave and stay gone. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that if anybody, any one of us, receives that invitation, Father, we would do exactly what Hezekiah, Isaiah the prophet did. Take that thing and lay it before you. And say, God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. Father, whoever this is for, whatever purpose it serves, I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would visit this church today. Lord, Father, send down your spirit. Help us to be attentive to the word of God. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, just to kind of give you the little backup here. Uh, let me see here. Verse... 17, the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshika from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem and they were there come up and they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, and Rabshika, said unto them, now here, here we go now. This is where the invitation sets in. This is where the devil has you surrounded. What they did was they encompassed the city. Now the old warfare, like in those days, a war went like this. If you were going to try to take a city... You were foolish to just try to march in and try to get through that gate or try to get through that stone wall and take down that city. Normally what you did was you brought enough men, you brought enough food, you brought enough supplies, and you encamped around the city, you encompassed around the city, which caused the people in the city to close the gates, close all the openings, so that everybody out in the fields who have food and grain to bring to the markets there in town could not come in. And those inside the city are stuck in there and nobody can leave and nobody can come in. Which means that if they don't have enough food in the city, all the encompassing army has to do is wait to starve those people out. Hunger drives us to do a lot of things, doesn't it? Now I want to make this point here for a minute and I want you to listen to me. Hunger, Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness, for they shall be filled. You've had times in your life when you got sick and tired of sin. You couldn't take it anymore. 
You couldn't live that way anymore. You saw it was destroying you. It was destroying your life. It was destroying your family. It was destroying everything that was precious to you. And you said, I can't do it anymore. And what you did was, you weren't hungry for the things of this world anymore. You were hungry for God's way in your life. You were hungry for forgiveness. You were hungry for repentance. And you were hungry for righteousness. And you came to God and said, God, I want to live a different way this time. Somebody say amen. But here's what also happens. Buddy of mine from college, I remember. We went out and had a big buffet one time, and I mean, they had crab legs, and boy, I mean, we just had plates mounted over with old broken crab legs. We sat back, and my old buddy Todd, he leaned back and he said, Oh, I remember the days, boy, now would be a good time for a cigarette. I just kind of looked at him, and over the months, I began to hear him talk more and more about his old life. He was about eight, nine years older than me. He had already done a ton of drugs, been with a lot of different mates. And I didn't know it at the time, but some of them were even men. And what was going on in his life was, instead of him hungering and thirsting after righteousness, he was hungering for sin. He wanted sin back in his life. He missed it. He missed the drugs, missed the cigarettes, missed the alcohol, and missed the fornication. And after I left that semester, I, I don't know, I that was the only thing holding him back. Because after I left that semester, one of, one of our other friends called me and said that he started dating a uh, male disc jockey there in Oklahoma City. To this day, last time I checked on him in Facebook, he was still a sodomite. He received the invitation to go back to the goods and he left what he said he was going to give his life to. He was training to be in the ministry like I was. But he left, turned his life back around and went back into sin. I've seen people do that over and over and over again. I would to God that it didn't happen to you. But let's continue reading this morning. Verse 19. Rabshakeh said unto them, Speaking now to Hezekiah, and thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? That's throwing doubt upon your faith. Thou sayest, in verse 20, Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now in whom dost thou trust? That thou rebellest against me. Verse 21. Now behold thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed. Even upon Egypt. And on which if a man lean. It will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. By the way now I agree with that. There's a, there's a place in the Psalms. That says why go down into Egypt and trust in Egypt. Why trust in their horses and their chariots. And then later on, the psalmist says some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. But we will trust in the living God. So now in verse 22. But if you say unto me, we... Now listen to this now. This is not a message for lost people per se. It is a message for every one of us sitting here listening to this this morning. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? Now he obviously did not understand what Hezekiah did. Those were not God's high places. Those were high places of Baal that he destroyed. You know what? This world does not understand what it is that we believe and who we serve. Amen. And then they try to tell us how wrong we are. 
And how wrong are then they? I like it when people try to tell us, well, the Bible says Jesus loves everybody. And then when you say, yeah, the Bible says sodomy's wrong. Well, the Bible was written by men. <laughs> Idiots. And then he said, um, Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria. We're in verse 23. And I will deliver thee 2,000 horses. Listen to the gift now. Number one, the devil will pay you well. He'll pay you well. You serve him. You know who makes rock stars? The devil. How many of y'all believe that? Say amen. You know who makes movie stars? The devil. You know who makes Democrats and weak Republicans? The devil. You know who makes noodle for a backbone preachers? The devil does. And he pays them well. There's, go through Springfield, Missouri, there's all these mega churches everywhere. I don't see how they do it. But I see on their board there, Sunday morning service, 10 a.m. That's it. Preacher preaches one sermon, gets paid quarter of a million dollars a year. Preach one sermon. I think I'm doing a slow way down. No, I'm not. But he pays them well. Verse 23, now therefore I pray thee give pledges to my Lord the king of Assyria and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. He's mocking them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Verse 25, and I now come up without the Lord against this place no, verse 25. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? Look at what he says next. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, believe it or not, I think I believe him here. Because I know what happens at the end of the story. And I know what happened before this story. Let me tell you what happened before this story. Remember I told you they had to encircle the city? They encompassed it to starve them out. Do you know what happened in Jerusalem before this happened? Jerusalem had one of the biggest revivals that they had ever seen in history. God started moving amongst the people. And automatically, without Hezekiah saying a word, people started bringing in lambs, goats, oxen, grain, by the bushel basketful. The Bible says Hezekiah had to build big old uh, barns or silos or whatever, big old booths. Had to hire new people to tend to the animals. They didn't have enough Levite priests to sacrifice all the sacrifices and they had food everywhere. And then this guy comes and thinks he's going to starve them out. They got enough food in there for 10 years. Who's going to starve in this deal? And you know what? That's what God will do. God will lay the blessings on you and bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. And when the devil comes against you, you do have the power to withstand him. And you can outlast him. What did Jesus say? Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. So now watch this. 
He said, am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Again, I think God told him to. The reason why is I know what happens at the end. But now here's the invitation. Then in verse 26, then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah and Shebna and Joah and under Rabshikah, speak, I pray thee to thy servants in the Syrian language for he understand it. They did not want this guy speaking Hebrew. Why? They did not, these guys on the wall did not want the Jews to hear what this guy was saying and be discouraged and think that maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe we will lose our lives. Maybe we'll die here. Oh no, if, if he's out there, he's going to come and kill us all. What are we going to do? Now I'm going to be honest with you. Over the many, many, many years that I've been preaching, I've tried to warn people not to listen to filthy music. Not to watch filthy TV shows. Not to read the wrong kind of books. Not to trust what you see on Trinity Broadcasting Network. Not to trust what you hear on so-called Christian radio stations, especially nowadays. Not even to listen to what they call most, or I'd say a vast majority of contemporary Christian music. It's junk. In other words, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, I'm hoping that you'll stop listening to the world and start listening to God. Because you know why? The world will always tell you what you want to hear. Now that same family, that same couple that came down to that altar that Sunday morning down there at Richwoods, Missouri, man, I was encouraged. Woo! Oh, God moved during that service. Man, before we could even preach, people's coming down to the altar. About eight to ten months later, his mother, we went to that church, she told me, she said, you know what he's doing? He's going around to his brother who's lost. He's going around to his younger brother who's lost. He's going around to people he works with and he's asking them, you think it's okay to take a drink every now and then? He's asking the wrong people, isn't he? You know, you know what they're going to tell him? Well, I take a drink every now and then. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Yeah, I suds it up at night. In fact, I, I kind of suds it up on the way home. Kind of helps me relax from, you know, having a busy day at work. Just kind of smooths me out the time I get home. I'm just good and limber, and I just kind of sit and lay there on the couch, drink all night. They told that man what he wanted to hear, and he ended up listening to it, left. To this day, I don't know that he's back in church. I know his mom and daddy's dead, but to this day, I don't think he's back in church. And what I'm telling you is, there's a reason why I don't rent you reading an NIV and I don't want you listening to the world. And I want you to be careful about what you read on the internet or who you listen to on the internet or what YouTube videos you watch or what Facebook pages you like. Because they may just be full of poison and you wouldn't know it. You know what happened this last Wednesday night? I, I don't know 100% because I didn't ask, I didn't get involved. But apparently God was dealing with some young adults in that church about some of the lifestyles they were living and possibly things that I brought up during the course of the week. God began to deal with them and they got scared, not just the fear of the Lord, they got scared of what the devil could do and they went running to Jesus. And I like that. When you find yourself listening to the wrong thing, come running to Jesus for help. 
I, uh, I'm going to try to quit say, I'm going to try to quit saying, somebody say amen this morning. Because whether you amen or not, it's true. In verse 27, back in verse 26, he said, I pray thee to talk to us in the Syrian language for you understand it and talk not with us in the Jews language and in the ears of the people that are on the wall. They did not want the people discouraged. They did not want them to fall for the lies. Verse 27, but Rabshika said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall? Now I'm going to read this phrase here. And I'm not trying to be vulgar, but this is the word of God. It means what it says. That they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you. What that means is that they intended to starve the Israelites long enough to where they would drink their own urine and eat their own dung to try to survive. It's quite possible that those of you who have spent way too much time not reading your Bible, not praying, not hearing the Word of God preached to you, it is quite possible that right now you're feeding on dung and urine. Waste. Corruption. Garbage. How hungry did the prodigal son get? Have you ever seen what hogs eat? They take food out of grocery stores that is wilted, rotted, and molded, and they sell it to hog farmers for slop. I imagine back in Jesus' day, it was much worse. There's a reason why Jesus didn't want them eating pigs. Because of their diet. But that young man got so hungry that he would have eaten the slop that the hogs were feeding on. And when you get so hungry that you just sit and feed on corruption, Maybe it's time to come back to the Lord where there's some food. Verse 29. Thus saith the king. This is the king of Assyria. Let not Pastor Mike deceive you. I mean, let not Hezekiah deceive you. Somebody's going to try to plant it in your ear that I'm a liar. Oh, you preacher, you don't know what he's talking about. He don't know what he's doing. He's off running around country telling everybody about UFOs and witches and all that junk. Why well, come to our church? We'll tell you how to succeed in life. Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. I'm standing here telling you, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will surely be saved. You will surely be forgiven. You will be delivered. And God will never turn you over to the hand of your enemies. Now after I say that. I guarantee you this week the devil's going to come along and say. Your preacher's a liar. Verse 31. 
Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. Do you know what gift the devil wants in exchange for giving you the things that you lust after, the things that you desire? Tell me what he wants. Your soul. Bring me a present. And I'll give you everything you lusted after. I'll give you everything you want. Jeffrey Epstein. Multi-millionaire. Run around with presidents. And high-class business people. And Prince Randy Andy from England. Nasty people. Disgusting people, powerful people, people that he thought could keep him out of prison because he was messing with 13-year-old girls, had underage women on his island, had flying people out to his island, hooking them up with these girls to make them all complicit in his crime so that they would never allow him to be turned in by any police department or justice system in any country, ended up dead by hanging in his prison cell. Whether he did it at his own hand or somebody did it. The devil always gets his price, doesn't he? Always. Verse 31 again, about midway. He said, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. And then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree. And drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. Until I come and take you. Listen to this. Listen to this now. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. Well, wait a minute. If it's a land like my land, why don't I just stay in my land? All right, we, we started going to such and such church. Now, that he preaches like you, Pastor Mike. Now, he don't use the King James, but he preaches just like you. That's not the same. If he ain't using King James, he don't preach like me. But see, that's what the devil offers, isn't it? What did, Na what did Ahab offer Naboth in exchange for his vineyard? I will give thee... The worth of it in money, or I will give to thee a better vineyard. Well, if Ahab had a better vineyard, what he need Naboth for? He's just going to steal it. He just didn't want you to have it. It's a trick. It's a trick. He always is lying to you. And I just want to ask you a quick question. Is hell anything like heaven? I want to take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive, oil, olive, and of honey. He just happened to mention honey, didn't he? That you may live and not die. What was it? One of our founding fathers said of this country, those who would exchange Safety or liberty for safety deserve neither. Live free or die. But do you know what most modern American generations, you know what they live by? Give me, give me, give me. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the king, out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Now what he's going to do, he's going to run through the king's resume. He's going to tell us now all of the great king 
kings now and all the gods that he's destroyed. Uh, I have here Exodus 20 verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 34, take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And you spend your time worshiping the light of your television, worshiping the light of your internet, time at the altar of Facebook, and have very little time for God. And yet our God said he's a jealous God. Do you think he's looking down upon you with the favor that you've believed in your mind that he is? Probably not. Verse 15, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. God said all this. Daniel 325, the fourth is like the Son of God. And Daniel 328, Nebuchadnezzar at that point made it a law and said that nobody should worship nor serve any god except the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he said there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Now, I'm here to tell you there is nothing in the devil's invitation for you Except the lake of fire. Let me move on. No other. Well, this is half my message right here. Genesis 28, 17. He was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. Let me ask you a question. And I, and I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to swell my ego. Or get my feelings hurt. Do you believe this morning that you are sitting in the house of God? There is none other but the house of God. Acts 4.11. I like phrases. I was looking at this last night. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and see what the king of Assyria is offering is another heaven promised by another king to live in another land to eat somebody else's honey and to drink out of somebody else's cistern. That's what he's offering you. And I'm here to tell you there is no other well spring of water than Jesus Christ and his word. Galatians 1.8, the Apostle Paul said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be a curse, as we said before, so say now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You're not supposed to believe what they tell you on the TV. Not supposed to believe what they tell you on the internet. You're not supposed to believe that garbage. Turn the internet off. I've told people this on the phone. People have gotten in arguments with me on the phone, told me this, that, and the other. I, I told them, I said, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you're spending way too much time on the internet, not enough time in the Bible. You know, they didn't like me saying that to them. But it's true. They're getting their prophecies and their ideas about what the devil is doing. They're getting it from the world. But they're not getting it from the Word of God. 
And the Word of God is the only true map that will lead us through the days of the future that are coming to us. Somebody, I, I said I wouldn't say that. Now that was the invitation. This is the elimination. That though we are an angel from heaven preaching near the gospel, let him be accursed. What's going to happen if you receive the invitation? You will be eliminated. God will cut you off. And he will cast you out from being a people. Did he not do it to Israel? In fact, the entire Old Testament is filled with God's word against the people of Israel, not for them. It was always a warning from the prophets of God. If you repent now, maybe I will forgive you. But it looks like to me your disease is incurable. And there is no hope for you. Now I've known people that have been gone for a long time and have finally come back and praise God they did. But I'm here to ask you this morning, are you willing to take that chance? Good grief. Are you willing to take that chance? Are you willing to listen to the invitation the devil sends you and says, well, you know what, I'll go out and play with sin for a little while, and then I'll, I'll get my fill of it, and then I'll come back. You know what you might as well do? You, know, you might as well get you, I've been watching Prices Right. You might as well get you some of them big red dice that Bob Barker has, you know, where they roll them for the price of the car. You might as well get you a couple of those and just roll them across the church floor and say, Come on, seven! Come on, seven! If they hit seven, I know I'm going to heaven. Who in here would be stupid enough to take a chance like that? Who in here would be dumb enough to sell your house, your cars, and take all your money and life savings and all your retirement and buy lottery tickets with it? Surely I'll win. No, you won't. No, you won't. He says here, in, back in 2 Kings 18, Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? And in other words, he's saying, I, we've defeated all these gods. Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Where are the gods of Hena? Where are the gods of Ipha? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? No. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my, out of my hand. God had let this king win so many battles that he got cocky. He beat lesser gods and that made him think that he could beat the most high God. But he can't because he's the most high God. I'm going to close it down here in a minute. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10 and I'll close. Now I want you to ask yourself the question. I brought this up earlier. Out of over 600 some odd thousand that left Egypt headed for glory, how many of them made it? Two. And again, I want you to understand, I've received that invitation more than once. Mike, I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything you want. Just follow me. Mike, I'll give you your best life now. 
Just follow me. Even in the ministry, years ago, when I was filling myself full of Rick Warren doctrine and Bill Hybels doctrine about being a seeker-friendly church and preaching positive messages to people so that everybody will like me and we'll have a big mega church. You know what God would have done with me? He would have turned me over to where I would have had a rock band on the stage and a guy with no shirt on. Like that church in Arkansas. First Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10.1 Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How many of you are on your way to being overthrown? Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. As they also lusted. Let me ask you men, is your lust worth it? Is your lust worth busting up your marriage? Losing your children? Ask some of these Young ladies in this church who have or are in the process of divorcing their husbands because of unfaithfulness. Ask them if they believe that their husband's lust was worth them losing their families. And I say to you, no, it's not. It's not worth it. Best thing I've got in my life is a loving wife Loving children and grandchildren that just can't get enough of Papa and his candy. And the devil tried to talk me out of it. Verse 6, these things are written to, as examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. I'm telling you fornication is everywhere. As some of them committed and fell in one day. God killed 23,000 people in one day for the sin of fornication neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of serpents you know what tempting God is tempting God is thinking you can accept the devil's invitation on a temporary basis make God forgive you so you can come back and act like nothing happened Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured were destroyed or destroyer. Now all these things happened to them for in samples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I want you to bow your heads this morning. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Very serious time. I told you I was going to read this and quit. It's very possible that someone listening to my voice right now thinks that everything's okay with them and God. You think everything's right. You think you're standing. You think, well, I haven't been brought down. Oh, yeah, I sin every now and then. I, you know, I enjoy this. I kind of do it after that after a while, and I got a worldly taste. You know, after me, it's, well, so does everybody else, and I'm just like everybody else, and that, it's okay. It, I mean, God still loves me. And I, you think you stand, and God said, take heed. You're the one that's going to fall. I'm wondering 
Who is it this morning close to falling? Close to accepting the invitation? Or maybe, maybe you've stepped in that direction already. Maybe it's not too late for you to turn around. Maybe it's not. Now I'm going to lead in prayer in about 10 seconds. And in that 10 seconds, you will either remain where you are, or you will come down here to one of these benches, and it does not matter to me where you do it. But we've got these benches. We're going to keep these benches. We're not going to remove these benches. And these benches are for prayer.